It's certainly good to be here this afternoon. It's good to be here at the lectures. Is I want to say before we begin our discussions this afternoon, of course we have three of the brethren here, and I'm going to let them announce their own subject when they get to it. And we're going to speak in the order of, uh, first of all, will be, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Ken Holton, who's to my right uh, on the end here. And Ken Holton was a graduate of Oak Christian College in 1980. He has worked with congregations in Comanche and Sulphur, Oklahoma, and Tallahassee, Florida. For the past two and a half years, Ken has served as pulpit minister for the Las Vegas Trail Congregation in Fort Worth, Texas. Ken is married to a former Karen Elaine Curtis. Uh, is that right, Elaine? Right. Elaine Curtis. And they have three sons, Nathan, Landon, and Jordan. Uh, Tony Smith, most of you know here too, also is my immediate right, was born in Nashville, Arkansas, July the 20th, 1944, and raised in Texarkana, Texas. Tony is a graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching, 1982. He has preached for congregations in Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas. He is currently at the Hanley Congregation in Fort Worth and is also a teacher for the Brown Trail School of Preaching. He holds several meetings each year and speaks on several lectureships. He and his wife, Debbie, have three sons. And I'd like to stop here just to say that it's already been mentioned that uh, Tony and his family are leaving us, going up in Tennessee. And uh, what's the name of the? Dresden. Dresden, Tennessee. And I understand it's a good work. It's a good area. But uh, their gain is our loss. I personally hurt, certainly hate to see Tony leave our area. And I know I'm not alone in that. Everybody that knows him, I'm sure, feels the same way that I do, and we wish him the very best. Gary Fallis uh, received a B.S. and uh, M. Uh, 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 Master's in Education from East uh, Texas State. He also earned degrees at Abilene Christian University and uh, Bible and, of course, religion and so on. And he has spent 25 years in full-time preaching and five years preaching part-time in Texas and Louisiana. He has taught in uh, Champions Bible College and accomplished other teaching assignments in lower grades. He joined the faculty of the Brown Trail School of Preaching in 1987, uh, where he now serves as, uh, as administrator. I want to express my personal appreciation for the fact that uh, I was invited to be on this program and to have a part in this panel discussion. And uh, I want also the elders of this congregation to know how much we appreciate them. And then the faculty and the administration and all that are connected with the school. I want to say this also, that I don't think I've ever lived in a place where a school of this type has been more cooperative uh, the churches as they work together and they certainly work with us and helped us in so many ways at East Hills. And I want them to know and I want to express that publicly so that you'll know that we certainly do appreciate uh, them, the elders and the preachers and their attitude and their cooperation in this. We have a subject today that I feel like is one of the most, if not the most important subject that we could be discussing at this time. Crime is six times uh, more common today than it was in 1960. The moral fa uh, fabric of our society has continuously deteriorated. And incidentally, these things that I mentioned, uh, we don't have to argue these points because those of us who have lived for some time and through these things know that it's a fact. And you know that this is a fact. And we need to do what we can to try to correct the situation. And it seems that it is still accelerating at an alarming rate. There are very few families that in some way have not been affected by alcohol, pornography, premarital and extramarital sex, teenage uh, pregnancies, unwed mothers, and homosexuality. All of this leads to sexual immorality, uh, such as incest, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and the such like. Some sociologists are predicting that by 2020, 50% uh, of all babies born in the United States will be born to unwed mothers. There are five times as many illegitimate births in 1990 as there were in 1960. According to the June 2, 1994 issue of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, taxpayers are spending $34 billion a year to, spend the, uh, to uh, support the growing number of poor families begun age mothers. 
Can you imagine the psychological effect that this will have on generations raised under such influence? Since 1960, the divorce rate has quadrupled, and the child is three times as likely to be living in a single parent home. 51% of the automobile accidents, uh, accident deaths are alcohol related. The uh, beginning of the breakdown in morality as we currently know it occurred back in the 50s. This was about the time that the state colleges and universities began pushing secular humanism and situation ethics, which they were teaching prior to the 60s. The philosophy has spread in our nation to the point that we can see its fruits in every community. Since then, many of our government officials, including at least a couple of our presidents, have succumbed to the influence of such wicked practices. This has led our society to revel in lasciviousness. Instead of being leaders of men, these officials have become the tail and caused the people to err and are destroying the paths of our youth. In book of Isaiah, the third chapter in verse 12, speaks of these uh, people back at that time who were trying to lead and yet uh, the public was influencing them in such a way that their leadership was almost nailed, if not nailed, as far as things that are right is concerned. God created the universe and set in order the laws of nature for the benefit of mankind, Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Everything was created perfectly and put in operation for the benefit of all life, and especially mankind. The sun, stars, plant, planets, and uh, even the things that here upon the, first, uh, upon the face of the earth, everything was created, was good and, it, and perfect, and the things that he created in the solar system, uh, all of the stars and the moons and the planets and what have you, they're in perfect uh, orbit. They are precise in every detail. The air has been created pure and clean, so have the, body, so have the bodies of water upon the earth. When the waters in the oceans and streams have been contaminated, the marine life dies. And when we pollute the air and breathe in impurities, it can damage our health and eventually kill us. This principle is true with any violation of nature. If we ignore the law of gravity and jump off a 10-story building, it will be fatal for us. Uh, we must abide by the laws that God has given, even the law of gravity. Take the uh, ocean, for example. God created the ocean, he created fish, and put there they cannot live upon the land. When God's law of nature is violated and a fish is thrown out on the land, he can't get back to the water, he dies. Same thing will be true with a human being that's thrown out in the middle of the ocean, no way for him to be rescued. It's not natural for him to live in water. He lives on land and breathes air. Now God fixed it that way for us so that we could enjoy things from a physical standpoint. Not only that, but when God created man, uh, he did not leave him on the earth to wander aimlessly through life. He expected us to follow his laws of nature, and he also expected us to follow his spiritual laws. His spiritual laws are put there just the same as the laws of nature. And whenever we violate those laws, go contrary to that, resist God's laws from a uh, spiritual standpoint, then we're going to face spiritually what men and animals and other life upon the face of the earth will face when they're taken out of their natural environment, that which was designed and made for them. Now there are a number of passages of scripture, and I'm not going to take time to read these because I want to give these brethren time to talk and so on, but these scriptures are in, in the book. And uh, you can look at those as long with the article and so on, and uh, we do know that it's not within man that walks to direct his own steps. Another point I'd like to mention, let's remember that God's laws are higher than our laws. God's law is higher than our law, and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And then uh, another thing that we need to remember too, that there are those that defend their philosophy, philosophy and way of life against Christianity. There, therefore, they will resort to any effort to try to destroy the influence of Christianity. I may have a few more things to say about that a little bit later on, but this ought to let us know that this is an important subject. People are not respecting the Bible, let alone reverencing the Bible. They make fun of it. They make fun of those of us who are trying to live the Christian and try to 
refer to us and make it appear that we're a bunch of bigots. And actually, when in reality, they are the bigots when they refuse to let us speak and refuse to let what, we, what the Bible teaches and what we believe that the Bible teaches uh, speak for itself. There are those that call good evil and evil good. They don't know the difference. And that's one of our problems. So at this time, I'm going to turn the next five minutes or so over to Brother uh, Norton. Paul the Apostle writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Wherefore come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, thus saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul again writing says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. We're talking this afternoon about those things, some of those things which God considers to be unclean. Because God considers those things to be unclean, we as Christian people must also consider them to be unclean and do everything within our power to speak against those things as well as to reprove and rebuke those who practice such things. My subject this afternoon is the subject of pornography. And I would venture to guess that all of us here this afternoon have the idea that pornography is wrong, that it is an unclean evil in our world. And all of us, I would hope, would stand up against it, speak out against it, and do whatever we can to show that it is immoral and evil and wicked and that it dehumanizes mankind. The word pornography has many different definitions, but the literal definition of the word pornography goes back to two Greek words, one pornos and the other graphos. The word pornos means filthy, low. And the word graphos means writing. Therefore, at the very beginning, the word pornography simply meant filthy writing or low writing. But now it has come not only to refer to those writings and those magazines which we would consider to be filthy, but even the sexually explicit movies that we see in theaters and even coming into our homes through the cable uh, television networks. What can we do about pornography? Before I speak about what we can do about pornography, let me say a few words about what we must say against pornography. There are several things that I believe to be important for the Christian. The Christian life is a matter of saying and doing. We're to be preaching and proclaiming the message of God, but at the same time, we must be living a different kind of life. And so if we're living as the world lives, and we're not being God's people, and having the influence over mankind as we should, it doesn't really make any difference what we say. People are not going to listen. So it's important for us to say some things concerning pornography and then do something as well. Let me mention four things that I believe we as Christians need to, pray, to preach and proclaim. Number one, the message that we should present against pornography is the authority of the Bible. The Bible tells us in so many different places that this book that we hold in our hands is God's word, that it is authoritative. It is inspired by God, and its message is inspired. And it is a message that meets the needs of this century as well as the centuries that will come after us, possibly, and those that have gone before. The message of the Bible is to be the message that we proclaim. We must preach it. We must stand against those things that we consider to be wrong from our study of God's Word and stand strong on the authority of Scripture. Secondly, we must present the message concerning God's law and the sexual behavior of mankind. The Bible teaches one man and one woman for a lifetime. It teaches against homosexuality. It teaches against abnormal sexual deviant behavior. It teaches against polygamy and other uh, sexually immoral vices. And we need to be strong in proclaiming to a world that is sexually immoral the importance of God's law concerning the sexual relationship between a husband and wife and that the bed, according to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 4, is to be a bed that is undefiled and honored. A third message that we must preach in the 20th century concerning pornography is the message of forgiveness. Those who have been involved in pornography, child pornography, uh, hardcore pornography, soft core pornography, uh, should understand the message of God that they can be forgiven. That God 
pardon. He's eager and ready to accept their confession and repentance. And he opens his arms to those who have committed uh, these sexual deviant acts. And fourth, I believe the message that we should proclaim is that man is valuable. Pornography dehumanizes mankind. Pornography simply considers man as an object to be used and abused and exploited. While the Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 2 and other passages throughout the Bible that man is valuable, made in the image of God, and therefore man should be highly respected and should be treated with respect. We must say then that the Bible is God's authority and preach it firmly, boldly, and yet in love. We must understand and let the world understand that God's laws concerning marriage and the sexual behavior between a husband and wife is pure and wholesome and right, but outside of marriage it is wrong. We must preach forgiveness to those who are wrapped up in pornography and other sexually explicit behavior. And we must proclaim man's value. But I believe what Edmund Burke wrote 200 plus years ago to be true even today. The one thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And it's important that we not only speak concerning God, but also act differently. Therefore, I think it's important that we be different from the world, that we be God's people. That we not allow these sexually explicit movies to come into our homes and not pay good money to see these things. I believe it's important for those of us who are parents with children still in the home to monitor uh, what goes into our homes and what our children watch and make sure that we are unique and a separate people and that we stay away from and shun those things that we consider to be vile and degrading. We need to be different, and I think that's the message. We need to exercise our rights as American citizens, speak up, talk to our congressmen, our president, write letters to those who are in authority in our government and let them know our views concerning pornography and what we think to be obscene and wrong in the eyes of God. Stand strong, do something, be involved in the process. And thirdly, I believe it's important as we study the subject of pornography and face it head on that we seek God's divine help. We can't do anything without God, but with God, we can do anything. And I believe the scripture to be true in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And we have a difficult task ahead of us, but it's a task that must be faced, and with God's help, it can be faced. Brother Smith. <clears throat> you know, the Bible tells us that we are not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Then the Bible says that those things will pass away, but the Word of God will not pass away, but will stand sure. Second John, or 1 John chapter 2, <laughs> verses 15 through 17, has told us that we must not be involved in worldly things. We must keep our lives away from the world and the things that are of the world. And he lists the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. My topic is fornication and adultery. Now, if we think about lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life, and then take into consideration our topic, we can see that all three of those temptations come into play in man's sexual immorality. It's a very serious thing when we violate God's word. The Bible tells us that when we transgress His law, we have sinned. So we must be very careful that we don't allow these things to come in and become a part of our life. As has already been spoken, we allow these things because of our familiarity with them. Somehow or another, we as God's people, if we're going to stand as God's people, we're going to have to stand upon God's Word. And throughout the Bible, God has condemned sexual immorality. If we would get into our study, we would probably need, first of all, to define some terms. First of all, I want to define adultery, and then we're going to define fornication, and then we're going to look at some of the things involved in the reasoning behind this prohibition. Adultery is defined as unlawful sexual relations with the spouse of another. Uh, and the question often rises, uh, what's the difference between adultery and fornication? 
Well, as I've said, adultery is the uh, sexual relationship between uh, people who are not married, and one being a spouse of another. Fornication, though, is a general term which includes any and all illicit, improper, ungodly sexual relationships. Now, that covers everything from homosexuality to bestiality to any kind of thing we want to put into the picture. I believe it, it includes even this pornography because it is the, uh, the use of one's mind to go against what God would have the mind be involved with. But as we look at this and think about that, we understand that in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, the Bible there says very clearly, thou shalt not commit adultery. And of course that was given so that the people, God's people, Israel, would understand that they were not to be involved with that adultery. And of course the religions of the world around about them was really based uh, uh, very greatly upon this, this sexual relationships that they were have or the idea of sex. Even their gods and goddesses were in, uh, were um, uh, involved with this and were even patterned after uh, sexual immorality. And you know, today we sometimes uh, think about uh, that we're so much surrounded in, in pornography with things that are coming into our homes, uh, with the, the, the movement in the homosexual direction. And, and today we say, well, it's so great because there's so much of it going on. I want to read you a couple of things uh, that, that really uh, makes me wonder why we're so prone to go into this thing and make the excuse, well, it's so available when maybe a long time, uh, long ago it was not. Here's something that was stated, uh, taken from uh, history. It says there that, that Roman women were married to be divorced and were divorced to be married. Some of them distinguished the years by the names of their husbands. Like we might go back and say 1965 to 1970 was, and we might say we were in school during that time. They would distinguish the time frame of life by the husband that they were married to during that time. That's hard for me to imagine how a mind could go that far. Still worse was the unnatural vice which was rampant in that day and time. I'm talking about in the time of the New Testament, Caligula. Uh, notoriously lived in habitual uh, incest with his sister Drusilla. And Nero did not even spare his own mother in his sexual uh, activities. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Here we are today, we're facing the same sort of thing and sometimes I hear people say, well, it's, it, it, it's there, it's around us. Uh, we have to somehow or another adjust to it. And I understand that there are things that we have to do. But the only way to adjust to this kind of thing is stay away from it. Remember, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If we allow these things to become part of our thinking, and as was mentioned a moment ago, I cannot imagine how it is that we as intelligent people will sit around and watch a television program that is programming the minds of our children in this kind of direction. We don't have the courage to stop this kind of thing and then someday at some point in time we're going to wring our hands and we're going to cry out what happened. I really believe that this topic that we're talking about, sexual immorality, is something that's becoming more acceptable in society than we would like to think. Here's another statement that I wanted to read. Uh, it says, from the highest to the lowest, society was riddled with homosexuality in the, in the New Testament times. But it wasn't in one society and absent from the other, it was rampant. And we say, well, we understand and we want to make sure that we stay away from adultery and fornication. But if we allow those things to come into our homes in the form of magazines, in, in, in the form of, of TV, movies, or whatever it is, we're not staying away from it. In fact, we are uh, imbibing in those things. And listen, brethren, adultery has become a great part of many, many congregations in the form of 
divorce and remarriage question. We are beginning more and more and more to accept these kinds of things and begin to act like that this is a part of society, it's norm. Brethren, Matthew chapter 19 verse 9 tells us without question clearly what God expects of His children and that is purity. That's the word we need to remember, purity. Purity of mind, purity of spirit, purity of body. And the only way that we're ever going to come to accomplish that is to study God's Word. Learn God's Word, love God's Word, and respect it. Irregardless of what society does. Irregardless of whatever it is going on around about us. This idea, this... this uh, topic of adultery and fornication is a rampant thing. And let me add one more thing before I stop at this point. It seems to me that our young people, their heroes are people who are living in and committing adultery and fornication Amen. rather than having good, good heroes and idols I'm talking about people to look up to. And it begins with us, making sure that we give them good, clean things to be a part of their lives. Thank you, Brother Smith and Brother Fallis. <clears throat> Brother uh, Tony Smith certainly touched on the topic that um, I've been assigned because sexual sins are all related in that it is a transgression of God's will in regard to that particular responsibility of life. Few contemporary uh, issues have gripped the modern day secular and religious world like the push for the acceptance of the homosexual lifestyle. With the possible exception of abortion, no social problem is so commonly debated in society and throughout many churches in our nation. Probably no group is better organized than participants and proponents of gay and lesbian lifestyle. They exert a great deal of political clout. Witness the current president's um, policy regarding uh, gays in the military and the clamoring or the desire for votes on the part of um, those who are campaigning in both parties at election time. Homosexual propaganda is winning over many churches, some by deception, others by intimidation. Large companies and corporations are demanding their supervisors and officials give favored or preferential treatment in the hiring of homosexuals and this is pushed by the federal government to a great extent. Due to the militancy and dedication of homosexuals to their cause and their plan to saturate society with their way of life, no movement, in my opinion, is more dangerous to our nation, to our churches, and to our souls. Solomon said, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs Chapter 14, verse 34. I ask for this subject because of my abhorrence of homosexuality, and I guess I may be homophobic, um, and uh, to use that word. Parading itself as simply another acceptable lifestyle, homosexuality is riding in on the Constitution statement that there should be no discrimination in regard to race, gender, nationality and the like. Also, homosexuality plays on decent people's sense of fairness because uh, they reason if it's wrong to discriminate against a person because of color, it's wrong to discriminate against a person because of sexual orientation or one who's a homosexual. Of course, we know the difference is that race is based upon creation and discrimination is wrong whereas homosexuality is based upon a perversion of the created order. 
What does the Bible say? Three points I'd like to make. One, homosexuality is unnatural. Unnatural. Among the ungodliness of the darkened Gentile world, Paul teaches in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and following, that the Gentiles made God into a man, making God in man's image. But in addition, they profaned the image that God had given man. The scripture says, Wherefore God gave them up, he gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, vile passions or, or degrading passions. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. What was natural, that is the way God created in Genesis chapter 1, he created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him male and female created he them. And the Gentiles took that which was natural, the way God created it, and exchanged that for the unnatural. They exchanged the normal for the abnormal. Paul goes on to say, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, or one translation, committing indecent acts, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or which they deserved. Yet the practitioners and the parrots of homosexuality call this an acceptable lifestyle. And in their efforts to legitimize homosexuality, some have turned to scientific or medical evidence as proof, claiming there's a difference between the brain of one who's homosexual and one who is heterosexual. In other words, they're saying, God made me like this. And who are you to deny me my God-given rights and behavior? And according to this thinking, then homosexuality would be acceptable, being something that's determined by the genes, genetically. It's inborn, just like any other hereditary trait or characteristic. Of course, the Bible denies this. First of all, when is the truth of the Bible, God's word, to give way to so-called scientific truth in the first place? Of course, this follows the same path as proving evolution um, scientifically while the Bible teaches the order of creation. Secondly, homosexuality, in addition to being unnatural, carried the death penalty in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, and of course is condemned equally in the New. In Romans chapter, or rather in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, which is translated also homosexuals or sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. If homosexuality is unnatural, and it is, and condemned, and it is, thirdly, can homosexuals be saved? And the answer is yes if they repent and change the, their unnatural lifestyle, but no, if they remain the way they are. The Bible denies that homosexuality is inborn. Rather, homosexuality is a choice man and woman uh, make. The scripture in Romans says, leaving the natural use. Leaving the natural use or in regard to the women, they did change the natural use. That's a choice they made. That's a behavior that they made. Homosexuality then is not something that's genetic. It's not something that's inborn, but it's a learned behavior like thievery, drunkenness, or any kind of sexual sin, adultery, and the like. Admittedly, if a person's homosexual behavior is encouraged by childhood, sexual abuse or 
conditions of upbringing. Change may be difficult, but it can be done. Because verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 6 says of those who were homosexual and guilty of other sins, such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This sinful behavior was present, that is, the homosexual sin, was present among the people in Corinth who became Christians. However, they did not remain that way any more than the drunkard or the, th or the thief or the adulterer remained that way. We know that because they were cleansed and no one is cleansed, redeemed, or forgiven apart from repentance. Luke 13, 3, Acts 2, 38, and other passages. Those who had chosen to become homosexuals, even if they were influenced by, by strong factors, could choose not to be. God's grace is sufficient to save any and all people. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, 1 Timothy 1, 13. But it's not uh, necessarily easy. Sexual behavior is no doubt one of the hardest things to change, but not, in, not impossible, because we see that people in Corinth change that. People in Corinth changed from homosexuality because their desire to be saved and please God was greater than their desire to please themselves and remain in condemnation. So the question is, is it worth it? And we need to remember 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8 where Paul says, Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Thank you, Brother Fallis, and we're going to give these brethren an opportunity to comment on anything that's been said uh, just a moment, but, and you be sure and get ready with your questions. Uh, brother, how much time do we have? Twenty more minutes, okay, and that'll be just a few minutes apiece. Okay, thank you. Now, I'd like to emphasize uh, two or three things before we, you know, without getting into what these brethren are talking about, and I want to say that I personally uh, say amen to everything that's been said. I don't know of anything I would disagree with up here that's been said thus far. Uh, but I would like to make mention of this. Uh, you know, I think one of our problems is, is getting this across to the peoples of the world. You know, the world, they don't believe the Bible's the Word of God. Uh, they make fun of it. Even in the religious realm, uh, the nominationalism, they're getting to the point that they don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. You quote to them whatever the Bible says, well, that's just what somebody else has said. Now, I said that, uh, and it's no, uh, just what some other maybe historian or maybe some uh, person in the literary field and so on, maybe what they've thought and what they've said. And uh, so they don't know the difference between good. They call good evil and evil good. They set their own standards and all that. All of this we've been through with. But one of my problems is, is finding a way to get through to these people that the Bible is God's final authority in matters of religion. And I'm afraid that that's in the church. Uh, when you see some of these brethren that come along with this doctrine of grace only and things of that nature, when the Bible absolutely is plain against such as that, and other things could be mentioned. If we had time, we don't have the time. But uh, no wonder the people of the world uh, are like they are. We're not standing up for that which is right. And we need to emphasize, not only emphasize, but use credentials and information to prove to the peoples of the world that the Bible is not an ordinary book that is inspired word of God and that came to, from God revealed by the Holy Spirit. And uh, that I think we need to dwell on that. Not only that, but uh, when we think about uh, teaching others, we've got to come in contact with these people to teach them, homosexuals or whoever they are. You know, when Jesus was talking to the, uh, uh, to the uh, 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 publicans and sinners, sit down talking with them in the book of Matthew, I believe the seventh chapter, if I remember correctly. But anyway, he was talking to them, and as he was talking to them, the Pharisees criticized him for it. And they said, here's a man that's eating with the publicans and sinners. In other words, he was uh, associating with them, talking to them. And Jesus replied by saying, it's not those people uh, who are well, or to pull it to that, who need the physician, but it's those who are sick. We need to find a way to, uh, from a personal standpoint to come in contact with these people who are in sin, to talk with them without our being involved in what they're doing or leaving the impression that we condone such stuff as that. We've got to do it and we've got to conduct ourselves in such a way in our attitude and the way we deal with these people in a way that would make them uh, realize that we have something that we 
and that we uh, are not ashamed to declare the gospel of Christ to them. Uh, I, I just can't say enough on that, and I'm not going to take up these brethren's time, but I, I get a little frustrated when, when the time gets up, you know, and we can't. But anyway, let, let's think about that, brethren. We're to mortify the deeds of the body. We're to mortify the, 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 the flesh itself. Paul said in the book of Colossians, the third chapter, put to death, eliminate those things, and all of that. Now we have a couple of questions up here, and uh, I'm going to, uh, which one of you brethren, won't, I'm going to give each one of you here a question if you don't mind. You're having problems with your voice, I may give you one in a minute, but right now. Uh, how about taking this first one, just read it out loud and answer it if you will, Tony, one of you, and then. Uh, the question is, really there's two questions, what things constitute fornication? And of course, any and all illicit sexual activity is fornication. Uh, adultery is, is part of that, but, but fornication covers all illicit sexual activity. Uh, uh, even even down, I believe, to the to the uh, use of one's mind. Now, I'm not going to say that that would be grounds for the divorce, and that's part of the the question uh, for a divorce and remarriage. And the Bible uh, says that Jesus said, "Whosoever looks upon the woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart." There is the idea of looking, and and, and by the way, that's one good reason to for for people to dress modestly so that people will not look uh, upon others in, in uh, uh, unscriptural uh, wrong way. Um, so m my answer to this is fornication is all uh, improper sexual activity. And then the second question is, uh, uh, would the things of the mind um, uh, constitute reasons for divorce? And I believe you would have to uh, enter into the sexual intercourse uh, with one uh, and, and a thing that would not be repented of in order to, to have a, a scriptural uh, divorce. You, you don't have anybody else comment on that? Uh, does anyone else have a comment on that? I'd like to just make one statement about this on fornication. Now, you can't read people's mind. You don't know what they're thinking unless they some way express it. And so we, in my, in my thought, and I believe the scripture will back it up, that uh, the Bible doesn't give grounds for divorce if a person just passes in his mind a thought. But when he gets into the point and lets that lead him into uh, actual fornication or the act itself and so on, it leads to that. It does lead to that. And I'm not saying it's not a sin, it's wrong, but I'm talking about the divorce part now. But if a husband or wife really enters into the sexual activity or uh, the act of itself, Certainly, that gives a grounds of divorce. Of course, there are other things that enter into it, such things as repenting and forgiveness and things of that nature, which, of course, we don't have time to get into at this point. For M.L. Sexton, it says, but you go ahead with yours, and then I'll get mine. The question is, for a person who is dating, where does appropriate showing of physical affection leave off and sexual immorality begin? Uh, the only way I know how to answer that question is uh, I don't... I think the person who's asking this question possibly might be trying to draw a line somewhere, and I'm not sure that's easy to do. Uh, I think the scripture that comes to mind, abhor the very, very appearance of evil. The Christian has a responsibility of, of living a pure life, uh, being different from the world, as I said before. And we should not put ourselves in any situation that might tempt us to go cross the line, to pass the line and to do something that uh, we know is sinful and contrary to God's will. So uh, where does the line, where do we draw the line? I'm not so sure it's easy to say, but uh, I think the best course for the Christian is simply to stay away from uh, those opportunities that you might have to sin against God. I'd like to make a, a comment about this one. Um, Brother Winkler's in the audience, and I listened not very long ago to a tape that he made, uh, and there was a, uh, an illustration that he gave in that that really has stuck in my mind because this is often a question that people might ask. But the, the illustration that he was giving was about a lady, and this was in the state of Louisiana, uh, a lady that had 
for a period of time had been involved in a uh, wrong lifestyle. And someone had asked her what got her started going in. Now, this woman had repented, and she was working very, very diligently in the church uh, at that point in time. But the question was asked, when and where did this begin? And her answer was simple. She said, I let the wrong man hold my hand. Now, listen. If we're going to date, we ought to date a Christian, and we won't have to worry too much about lines. We're not going to have to worry about uh, how far we're going. We're going to date Christians both. Then, then, then those lines are already in our minds. I have this question here. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, please define the phrase evil concupiscence. Is all concupiscence evil, or uh, can some concupiscence be righteous? Well, let me get over here to the statement in uh, 1 Thessalonians. And in the fourth chapter in verse 5, and I want to read the passages before and after that as well. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. In other words, uh, our sanctification. We're sanctified. We're set apart. We're in Christ. We've been born into the family of God. We're not like people to the world, and we become new creatures and all of that. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. In uh, uh, Paul's letter, a statement over here in uh, the 23rd verse, uh, well, verses 22 and 23, he says, Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's the complete person. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Conduct yourself in such a way that your soul, that your spirit, that your body, your whole being remain purified and that you're preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now back over in chapter 4. He said in verse 4, he says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That's our body, our being, and our soul, and the spirit, and so on. Not in the lust of concupiscence. It's lust that he's talking about. Lusting after those things that are not right and not good. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. You see, the Gentiles did not know God. And they were very, it was very prevalent among them that they do these things and so on until they were converted. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner. Now if I go beyond and I <clears throat> commit fornication with a brother's wife or somebody, I have defrauded him and so on. I've done that which is wrong and sinful because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. So I would classify this as being evil and ungodly and uh, unrighteous and so forth and so on. Anyone else want to comment on that? Do you have anything else uh, that you want to mention about what's been said, Brother Fowles? Not at this point. Not at this point. All right, any other questions? Anyone else have a, okay, Brother Deaver? Would you mind coming up and taking this microphone? They can't hear you back. <laughs> Just stand right there, if you will, and take it. I'd be glad for you to do that because we want to hear what you have to say about it. I'll just talk and talk. <laughs> Don't get too close to it. <laughs> My point is that Tony has correctly defined fornication as being illicit sex, but that still raises the question or leaves the question, but what is illicit? And illicit simply is sex which is unauthorized. So our question ought to be, what is authorized sex? And when we settle that, we have settled the other. On well, the word concupiscence, just forget it. Get your American standard and read the word evil desire, and you've got it settled. That's it. <laughs> Anyone else? Brother Edwards. Oh, would you mind coming up here too, Brother Edwards? I can you? Okay. Say All right. Isn't there a difference between adultery or fornication in the heart and fornication? I'd like to hear some comment on that. 
Well, I think we, we made the distinction there a minute ago about the, the question just came about uh, the uh, being able to divorce on the uh, uh, pretense of the mind. Yes. And I think we answered that uh, that's not the case. Uh, Jesus did say, though, whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already in his heart. So we cannot deny the fact that it is adultery. But it is not that which is spoken of in Matthew 19, Good. verse 9. We're in agreement, obviously, but it seems to me you are making your distinction on a presupposition that there's a difference between adultery in the heart and adultery. Uh, one is, a, is a, a violation of your pact just in your heart, but you haven't actually done it. You haven't actually committed it. what is just adultery without the added modification of in the heart. Right. Uh, I might add one point, Brother Edwards, on that too, that if a person continues in that adultery in his heart, he will eventually commit the overt act. That's exactly right. But the one isn't the other. That's right. And that's the reason we've got to be very careful because uh, very recently a man said to me, well, my wife didn't actually go out with another man, but she committed it in the heart and I feel therefore I can divorce and remarry. He was passing judgment on her where he didn't have any business passing judgment. Yeah, even, that's right. No You're right. In the first place, if it's in the heart, why would why would uh, it be brought out in public anyway? That's right. That'd be a, that would be a that would be a that would be a, a, a flaw in character, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. Anyone else, brother Holton? You have anything else you want to add to this, brother Fallis? You better speak up now. We're going to wind this thing up in a minute. Okay. Let me say one thing. All right. I want to make one comment about, about Gary's topic. I, it, it, it is beyond my comprehension how anybody could say that people are born homosexuals. Now listen, if that is the case, if that is the case, then God created something that he turned around and condemned. And that's not God. That's just, that's just out of case. Well, God just mentions, or there's a Bible that mentions specifically that uh, a man laying uh, with another man, a woman with another woman, that is, he didn't use the word homosexuality, but he said it's an, ab uh, it, it's, uh, an abomination that would be lost. Romans, the first chapter, I think, is very explicit on that. But I think one of the problems that we have, you remember over there in Romans, the first chapter, where he said those people in, in their sins and so on, they were creating God in an image made like unto man. The problem is, so many times, people make up their minds the way they want it to be, and then they try to create God in the image of man to think like man thinks, and that just won't work. It's just not right. All right, Brother Mike. There's a difference between something being normal or natural and it's being usual. If you had lived in Lot's time in Sodom, homosexuality would have been a usual practice, but it never was normal. That's right. That's right. And never was accepted. You don't have to study ethics. You just understand something about human anatomy. You can understand it's a perversity of homosexuality just from the viewpoint of human anatomy. Here's one. It'll <laughs> uh, what about the transsexual men wanted to become women? <laughs> now who wants that? <laughs> Well, You're I, the oldest one. You have to. All right. I'm on, I, I just stick my neck out and say I, I, just, I just think it's ungodly. I just, I just, just, if that means anything, I didn't give you any scripture except uh, we're to go with the normal, how well, God created us and uh, not uh, use, uh, not change it as Paul speaks of it in the book of Romans. I think that would apply to that. Uh, the unusual, of course, is not the act of sex here, but anyway, it's the, it's the form there. And why not just be men and why not just be women? I think both can be glorified in their own position, own place. And I think it's a shame when we try to undo what God's created for us. And so, I don't know. Maybe somebody else wants to comment on that. Brother Deaver, you want to say something about that? <laughs> Not about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think maybe just to kind of summarize what has been said, if I have properly evaluated here, but all persons 
who practice homosexuality, refusing to repent, are persons who cannot enter the kingdom of God and who cannot go to heaven. Minor premise, Jake is a person who practices homosexuality and who refuses genuinely to repent. Conclusion, Jake is a person who cannot enter the church of the Lord and who cannot go to heaven. But now that's, that's the premise, or these are the premises, that's the conclusion demanded. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the argument as set out. But we must prove the major premise. That ties in the brother ML. But that's the problem here that we have not only in homosexuality or this area, but in everything else. We have to prove that God is and that the Bible is the Word of God before we can get off the ground with regard to any subject. So that's where Brown Trail comes in. You've got to have two years proving to these men, showing these men how to prove these things. It's got to be proved. Uh, is there anything else now? Time's about up, isn't it? Okay, we're going to, I thought maybe I might be giving you a little time back, but we're going to not. Well, anyway, we appreciate it. Appreciate your attention. All. We thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that loud. We certainly appreciate the panelists and the comments that they've made and the good job they've done. Uh, this was sort of a new experiment to us, and uh, uh, we took a little long in the presentations of, the, of what I had in mind. I was going to allow a little bit more time for discussion, but nonetheless, it was good, and we really do appreciate uh, everyone who participated in it. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that at 6.30 tonight, Brother Foy Forehand is going to be leading us in singing for about 20 minutes or so. And Foy is one of the best song leaders uh, that we have in the Brotherhood, in my opinion. And so we certainly want to participate in that. Then Brother Bobby Duncan is going to be speaking at 7 o'clock that we belong to God by right of purchase. Then Brother Johnny Ramsey, uh, our own Johnny Ramsey, I should say, will be speaking at 8 o'clock on obedient people to God. We have a lot of good things in store for us. There's one scripture that came to my mind uh, that I feel pretty well sums it up from 2 Corinthians 6. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you and shall be to you a father, and you shall be to me sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That seems to me to sort of wrap up what was being said. Brother Preston Cotham, well known by us all, a brother of Perry Cotham, the Cotham brothers are dearly loved, is with us today and he's going to be leading us in a dismissal prayer. Uh, Preston preached in Fort Worth, I believe at three different congregations. He's presently down in Hillsboro, Texas. And uh, following that prayer, we will immediately assemble in the hallway to my right, and I believe also the food is prepared in the hallway to the left. So what would be ideal would be for 50% of you to go that way and 50% of you to go that way. But I'm going to leave it up to you as to which uh, course you take. And it could be that we'll all be uh, lined up in one hallway. Yes, Earl. Sir? Questions? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have my mind on so many different things. Brother Earl Edwards, as we pointed out, will be uh, conducting the open forum tomorrow. And uh, he would like very much for those of you who have some questions uh, that you already have in mind to write those down and give them to him. Uh, that will start our discussion off if he can already have some questions written out. And so if you have some questions that you would like to ask, it could be something that's left over from today's discussion. If you will write those things down and hand them to Earl, then uh, he can uh, use those to get started. We will take questions from the floor also. One thing that was pointed out, I was informed later on, that any time we talk from the floor without the benefit of a microphone, it is not on the recording, and, and therefore it's just blank as far as the tape is concerned. So we've got to do something to correct that. The reason that we didn't do it today is
because we're limited in our microphone hookups, and this is all we had. Tomorrow we'll be speaking from just one, Brother Edwards, and there will be two available for uh, use on the floor. Will you bow your heads while Brother Cotham leads us in prayer?